So the, the question that's kind of the staple that everyone gets asked kind of at the start is just how you got into sound recording, especially the production side of things. Okay, um, my father's a production sound mixer, and uh, he bought me a Nakamichi cassette deck home that he couldn't, uh, it, was, it was kind of bust, and, uh, and he gave it to me when I was about seven years old, and I got it working, and uh, I had a dynamic mic, and I just started playing with it, you know, kids in those days, we didn't have any computer games to play with, um, when the, you know, living in London during the winter when it was cold and wet outside and I didn't want to go out on my bike or on my skateboard, I needed something to play with at home and, and that Nakamichi cassette deck started, uh, started my interest in sound. And what I used to do with my buddy, uh, he used to come around and we used to record a spoof radio show where we were the, we were the DJs, the presenters. And it was just a talk radio show. We didn't have access to any music. We were seven years old. You know, it was before my my love of, uh, uh, of pop music uh, came into my life. And so we were just literally just telling jokes and, and recording each other's voices. So I kind of, you know, I went through that thing when I was seven years old of, of recording me and him talking for a 90-minute uh, cassette and thinking we'd done a really good job and going to play it back and realize that I got the recording levels wrong and that we couldn't actually hear each other above the tape hiss. So all of those kind of uh, mistakes that a lot of people make later on, you know, when they come out into the world of sound as an assistant, I was making when I was seven years old. You know, the next week I'd overmod it, trying to get some signal down on the tape, and the whole thing would be distorted. So I was playing around with sound gear when I was about seven. Then, um, you know, in 1981 I was 11 years old, and that's really when hip-hop hit the UK. Um, and I was heavily into hip-hop. I kind of, I, I cobbled together two decks and a mixer in my bedroom and started cutting and scratching um, just for fun, you know, and uh, played at a couple of, you know, teenage parties and, and you know, and so I always had a love of sound equipment. Uh, then when I was about 16, I left school very early on and I got a job as a runner um, without the blessing of my mum and dad. Uh, they wanted me to stay and go into further education. I was kind of I, I had a hunch that I wasn't gonna that I wasn't gonna do well in further education. I had a hunch that that really wasn't it was gonna be a waste of my time. So I went and got a job as a runner in a commercials company where I learned an awful lot about the film business and I had a chance to look at all of the different departments. And all of my contemporaries at that point, the runners that I'd meet in the coffee shops around Wardour Street, all wanted to be um, in the camera department or of course directors. And uh, and, you know, and, and to be honest with you, I saw that those sectors were packed and it was going to be really, really hard to break into it. I kind of had this thing going on that I didn't want to get into sound because that's what my dad did and I didn't want an easy ride and, and you know, I didn't want any help from him, which as a 16-year-old, you know, working as a runner in Soho, I'm going to have that kind of attitude. Um, I did my two years as a runner. Uh, you know, I was in the office during uh, during non-shooting periods, and then I was out on shoots when we were shooting. So I was shooting at least every couple of weeks. I was out and watching the guys and 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 acting as a runner, stroke third AD on the sets. Then uh, then basically I went freelance as an AD, and it just you know what my heart wasn't really in it. By this point, I'm now 19 years old, and it kind of just hit me that every shoot I was on, I kind of gravitated towards helping the sound guys. I was always interested in what their equipment was, what they were using. Um, you know, my dad had had me out doing work experience at 14 or 15. Um, he, you know, very kindly took me on a couple of commercials when I was 14 or 15. Um, I actually went onto the set of The Yob, which is a very famous uh, movie directed by Ian Eames, starring Keith Allen. Um, very, very pop culture. British movie. I went onto the set when I was 15 and, and did a couple of weeks' work experience on that. So I knew I knew what sound was all about on film sets. And by the time I was 19, I kind of, you know, I still had the decks in my bedroom. I was still cobbling together bits of sound equipment, and it kind of just hit me. I was a sound man, and I went back to my dad and said, "Listen, I've I've tried to do it on my own. You know, I've I've gone to work for for three years now." two years in-house as a runner, and then a year freelance as a second AD on commercials. I want to come to work with you now. Can you take me out and teach me? Um, 
I went I went to work with him the first year. I was his I was his uh, his second AS. We call it now. Um, I you know I guess I was called a third man at that point. And at, in those days, he was doing the comic strip present series every every winter and commercials through the summer. So on the comic strip presents, I was working you know with comedy geniuses. I was working with um, Adrian Edmondson, Rick Mail, Nigel Planer, Peter Richardson, Robbie Coltrane, uh, Keith Allen. The list goes on and on. Alexi Sale, and those were the guys that you know that, that I was working with, and, and and you know, and that that taught me a lot. It taught me that the sound, the dialogue is really important because it's all about the comedy. And if they hit a moment and it's funny, they don't want to be going again for sound. Um, that's something I learned very very early on when I was a when I was a second AS, a second assistant sound, for my father. The next year after that, um, my father invited me to come boom operating for him. So I did a year's boom operating, and everything was great. I thought this is fantastic. You know, I had a, I had my meal ticket. I knew that I was going to get his jobs. And then he came back from uh, from a meeting one day and sat me down and said, "Listen, I've got some, I've got some news for you. It's great news for me. It's not so good for you." And he'd been offered a job as a producer, um, which was a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. He'd been mixing sound for many years, and and he went for it. But that left me at 21 years old uh, without. A sound mixer that I was working with regularly. Um, it left me in a position where I needed to go out and find my own work as a sound, uh, as a as a boom operator. And here's what happened: as I started getting involved with boom operating for other production sound mixers, I also started getting calls from my father's old commercial clients who had met me, um, because there was a huge shift going on in commercials at that time, and it was an interesting period. It's 1991. And what was going on in commercials? We were moving from this this kind of nuclear family, OXO family, sitting around the table talking about the gravy, which was the kind of the British commercial way. We we've always made beautiful commercials. Our commercials have always been the best in the world. Um, but suddenly we were hit with the MTV generation. We were hit with youth TV. We were hit with quick cuts um, comedy. The the, ta uh, the Fanta guy running around with an orange hand, slapping people around the face, and it was suddenly a, a, a kind of a whole different genre. Now, what happened in commercials at that point was a lot of very young advertising agency creatives started getting hired to write the commercials because uh, because they they wanted to hit the youth market. They wanted something fresh and funky. Those advertising agency creatives, of course, wanted to hire very young directors straight out of film school. The young directors wanted a young sound mixer. And so the people that had met me, boom operating on commercials for my father, when my father retired from sound mixing and went into producing, it was a natural thing for them to phone me um, and, uh, and give me a chance. Uh, so I was in the right place at the right time. And I always remember, and, and, and you know, here's the thing. One of the people that I will always remember for helping me in that situation was Madeline Sanderson, um, who is a massive producer in commercials. Okay, she she runs Partisan Films now, which anyone who does commercials they know who they are. Um, Madeline phoned me and said, "Look, Simon, we want you to come and do this commercial." And I said, "Madeline, I'm not ready. I'm still a boom operator. You know, I don't feel comfortable recording sound." And she said, "Look, it's three days of Atmos. Just come. We're going to have a great time." There's one line of dialogue. You're not going to mess it up, but if you do, we'll loop it. And so in I went. And, uh, and I didn't mess it up, and they didn't have to loop it, and that led to another and another and another. So what I was doing at that point in the early 90s was I was mixing commercials, but I was boom operating on dramas for drama mixers. Um, I was boom operating you know, TV drama with a mixer called Simon Hater, who taught me an awful lot. I also continued uh, boom operating the comic strip presents, but with Ian Voigt, who's another sound mixer, who taught me an awful lot. Um, and I, you know, I was I, I was mixing my own commercials. That's what that, that's the deal. That's how I that's how I started mixing.